Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Kauff Memorial Union Theater. In a few moments, President Kaler will deliver his 2016 State of the University Address. My name is Colin Campbell. I'm faculty in the Department of Pharmacology. And in my capacity as this year's chair of the Senate and Faculty Consultative Committees, I will be moderating today's event. In the context of the 165-year history of our university, the Presidential State of the Union Address is a fairly recent creation. On the other hand, this tradition, at least in its present form, dates back to the academic year 1993-1994. President Kaler is thus the fourth president of the university to make such a presentation, and today will be his fifth State of the University Address. Today's event provides the president with an important opportunity to reflect on his first five years in office and to outline his priorities for the upcoming year. Of arguably equal importance, today is an opportunity for members of our community, staff, faculty, and students to engage with the president and ask questions about the issues that concern us the most. About a little more than half of the time today will be devoted to the president's remarks and then we'll have an extended period of time for, for question and answer. So in a moment when I conclude my remarks, the president will deliver his address. After the presentation, I will join him on the stage, at which time uh, we will have a lengthy Q&A question and the questions will be drawn from three sources. The first is from a, a bank of over 100 questions that were uh, called through by uh, my colleague Jigna Desai, who's vice chair of the FCC. Uh, we chose the most important and representative questions from a, a list of over 200 that, that staff, faculty, and students provided. Uh, in addition, while this event is being streamed, my colleague will be in the green room uh, taking live questions from the internet audience and she will uh, in some manner uh, bring those forward to me so I'll have that pool as well and then of course we will I will do my best to allow people in the live theater audience to participate as well I, I want to stress that in recognition of the fact that over a hundred questions were submitted in writing that is the the primary source from <clears throat> excuse me from which questions will be derived but I'm gonna do my um, my level best to balance those questions with the other sources that I um, mentioned. I do hope we will get some questions from our electronic audience. Um, again, I'm going to strive really hard to provide an opportunity for you all and to help facilitate that I, I, I'm going to respectfully insist that you uh, formulate and deliver your question in a, in a, a 90 second or less format. I really um, ask that we do that so we are allowed to get everybody that we can as many chances as we can. With that, I, I thank you for your attention and I ask you to join me in welcoming President Eric Kaler to the podium to deliver his State of the University Address. President Kaler. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Colin, for moderating this event. And uh, it's a great opportunity for us to have a question and answer after I give a few prepared uh, remarks. Uh, I began by thinking about what, after nearly five years on this humbling job, what keeps me energized? What drives me? I know all the critical issues that we face together, from ethical research to campus climate to faculty governance to tuition policy. They are pressing and they are on the top of my priority list too. But honestly, and maybe it's the same for many of you, it's the little things that tend to give me the biggest boost. Student office hours drive me. Every six weeks or so, I set aside time and the opportunity to sit privately with some of our students, our amazing young people, to hear their concerns and their joys, and to regularly get pushed on my policies and thinking. If we ever lose track of the fact that students are the stars of our show, we will have lost our way. Faculty honors and faculty creativity drive me, and they get my competitive juices growing. I think back to 2014, when we were the only institution in the nation to have faculty selected to five of the most prestigious academic organizations in the country. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Philosophical Society. That was a good year, and I'd like us to do it again. And then there are events that I get to attend. Many drive me, but actually Farm Fest is the one that really pumps me up. Although my chemical engineering background didn't prepare me for it, it's a wonderful opportunity to sit in a casual environment with ag leaders and listen to their hopes and aspirations for the university and for the state and to help understand the intersection that this great university has, the importance of its land grant mission in intersecting the agriculture community. It helps me refresh my commitment to that land grant mission. So those are some of the things that drive me. Regents Anderson, Cohen, Devine, Johnson, Lucas, Rocha, and Simmons, either here at Kaufman or watching online across the state, welcome. 
members of our University Senate, colleagues watching in Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester, students, staff, faculty, distinguished guests, including Representative Nelson and Representative Barrett and Commissioner Pogelmiller, welcome here to the State of the University speech. What also truly drives me is the unmistakable momentum we have and the upward trajectory that this university is on, like few other American public research universities. Applications are up, ACT scores are up, our endowment is up, philanthropic giving is up, research activity is up, the number of students of color is up, the number of students graduating without debt is up, while those who graduate with debt have less of it than they had five years ago. That's all well and good, but it's actually not good enough, not nearly good enough. The ongoing work to improve our human participant protections requires constant vigilance, and we have yet to win back trust that we have lost. We need to improve our campus climate, especially for students and faculty of color. We have to carefully recalibrate and monitor our tuition policies, and we must vigorously defend fundamental university values such as academic freedom, freedom of expression, and freedom to conduct research that's legal and ethical, all with the goal of human understanding and well-being. Through our ups and downs and our debates, I do believe that what drives all of us and unites us is a set of shared values and accomplishments across all of our campuses. And let me give you an example named Amanda Weber. Amanda is a doctoral student in our music conducting program, and she shows us what unity and harmony can do and mean. <clears throat> when Amanda arrived on campus, about eight months ago, having completed her master's degree at Yale, she met Dr. Jim Verho, a U alum in communication studies and the educational director at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Shakopee. In other words, the prison, the women's prison. <clears throat> Jim wanted to start a choir, and Amanda, she wanted to make a difference. So she began weekly sessions with what eventually became the prison's Voice of Hope Choir. Before long, Amanda brought members of our campus singers maroon choir, students with many options, to Shakopee to sing side by side with women with few options. Barriers broke as a partnership of diverse voices was forged. And as Amanda says, a choir builds community while teaching critical skills. Singing in a choir means you have to listen to other people while evaluating yourself. It means being vulnerable to the discordant mistakes that you make and others may hear. But this group process, whether it's a choir or a department or a five campus university system, is not about wallowing in the mistakes, but rather how we recover from them. In our university of community, we are an extraordinary collection of voices brought together for the common pur purpose of enriching students' lives and the life of our state. We do that for citizens of vastly different backgrounds and with sometimes painfully different opportunities. We're a community with passionate and muscular visions and with large tasks in front of us to fuel the paths to success of thousands of our students, to create new knowledge for millions of others, and to drive tomorrow's prosperity for all Minnesotans by tackling grand challenges. And in Amanda Weber's work, Tucked behind prison walls, we witness the kind of day-to-day -day brushstroke that too often goes unnoticed amid a portrait splash from time to time with well-publicized challenges. So as I conclude my fifth year as president of this great university, it's important for me and I urge you to remember that from busy labs in Duluth to quiet libraries in Morris to vibrant classrooms in Crookston to community engagement in Rochester and to fervent rallies on Northrop Mall. We each contribute small slices to our university's impact and to our communities. So to together, every day, in ways big and small, we demonstrate the state of the University of Minnesota is transformative, vibrant, and strong, and the work of dedicated students and colleagues like Amanda Weber proves it. Amanda's here, and she deserves our thanks. So let me review. When I became president on July 1st of 2011, this university and this state were still recovering from the Great Recession. Tuition had increased by more than a third over the previous five years as state funding had been reduced by 17%. We needed to tighten our belts to reduce administrative costs and student support needed a boost. 
Our philanthropic infrastructure was burdensome at a time when giving was needed the most. New approaches were required to increase diversity in our student body and faculty, and our medical school needed renewal. Our relationships with business and industry in the state had room to improve. We had lots of work to do, and today, four months short of five years later, we can track our many responses and successes. We're not going to bask in them because we need to keep our momentum going. Don't take that success just from me, but take it from the Higher Learning Commission that recently completed its accreditation review of our Twin Cities and Rochester campuses and separately our Crookston campus. The HLC concluded that the university is firmly committed to continuous improvement and went on to say that since its last comprehensive evaluation of the Twin Cities campus a decade ago, and I quote, the university has made great strides in the areas of student success, sponsored research, and community engagement. When it comes to accessibility, affordability, and excellence, the facts support their conclusion. Over the past five years, our Minnesota resident students across all of our campuses have seen the smallest tuition percentage increases in 55 years. That's since the Eisenhower administration when I was four years old. This accomplishment benefits over 70% of our undergraduate student body. And this span of unprecedented tuition stability included a historic two-year tuition freeze we forged by renewing our partnership with the legislature and the governor. And by keeping a lid on tuition, we are defying the national narrative on student debt. Thanks to strong financial aid, we remain among the most affordable colleges in the state for students from families earning less than $75,000 a year. And for students at the lowest income levels, we provide grant aid without any loans that exceeds their tuition and fees and allows them to cover some books or living expenses. 40%, if you only remember one thing I say today, remember this, 40% of all of our Twin Cities undergraduate students graduate with zero debt. Now honestly, that's debt we know about. They may have credit card debt, their parents may have taken some debt, but the debt, the easiest debt to get through the University of Minnesota, they graduate with none of that, 40%. That's 36% across all of our campuses. Our success in reducing debt is part of a comprehensive strategy. First, affordability is directly linked to our commitment to operational excellence and a reduction in administrative costs, which have totaled $58 million so far. We've also made big investments in financial aid, partly because of record-breaking philanthropy from generous friends. We've dramatically increased our four-year graduation rates on our Twin Cities campus, and especially year over year for the past five years. And that's related to the increased preparedness of our incoming students and better counseling, advising, and availability of courses. And in two more years, with 32 million more in reallocations in administrative areas across the system, we'll, we'll have reached our ambitious $90 million goal. And that has not been easy. And I appreciate the tough choices that everyone has had to make. But as we can see five years into our work, there's a reason for that, and that is to maximize our investment in our students, faculty, and your research. That investment is also reflected in our system campuses. We've worked hard to address the financial challenges at UMD, and over the past several years have invested nearly $8 million in recurring support and another $6 million in one-time support for UMD's strategic enrollment management plan and to cover year in shortfalls. We are turning the corner this year with an encouraging 12% increase in, perspective, uh, in, in visits to campus by pr prospective students. In Crookston, the Wellness Center, developed in partnership with the state, is enhancing the student experience and student retention is up again, a great sign, as was the glowing reaccreditation Crookston received. And as always, our friends in Morris continue to be national leaders in sustainability, liberal arts, and diversity, with students of color comprising 27% of the Morris student body. And Rochester is honing its unique niche as a center for healthcare education. Together, we're working on a joint enrollment and curricular strategy for all of our campuses, which promises to ensure more Minnesota students have the University of Minnesota option and that current students can better access the strengths of our great system with five distinguished, distinctive campuses as they earn their University of Minnesota degree. So let me turn to research. In an environment of flat federal funding, remarkably, we've seen growth. As the eighth most active public research university in the nation, we have now topped for the first time 
more than $900 million in research activity across our system. Every day, it seems, another one of our faculty researchers is making news with breakthrough discoveries. Now, I spoke earlier of Amanda Weber's impact in music. Last month, another <clears throat> kind of music was reported, and it was this chirp. Listen to this. Now, you might think that was some weird gopher fans from outer space cheering Rachel Bannum's appointment as Big Ten Women's Basketball Player of the Year. <clears throat> but that, excuse me, that is actually a gravity wave. It was formed as a consequence of the collision of two black holes and detected for the first time ever. A little bit of science. The discovery depended on measurement of a displacement of one part in 10 to the 21st, or one part in a thousand billion trillion. And that displacement means that our Earth was briefly stretched by a little bit less than the diameter of the smallest nucleus known. Take my word for it, that's really small. But its discovery confirms something stupendously large, and that <clears throat> is the last prediction of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Proudly, our physics and astronomy associate professor Vuk Mandich and five of his students, including two undergrads, were part of the team that made this historic discovery. Now, this project cost over a 40-year period the U.S. National Science Foundation about $1 billion, but it confirms fundamental knowledge about how our universe works, and that makes it worth it. It's that kind of fundamental work that is the heart of who we are as a university and why we seek every day to wonder why and to long answer the seemingly unanswerable. This basic science, basic research is needed to advance our civilization. Excuse me. Where it leads, we don't know. That's why it's basic science. But we didn't know <clears throat> that finding out the structure of DNA was a double helix would lead to medical advances in a biotech industry. And we didn't know that fundamental mathematics would lead to encryption schemes for cell phones. That all of that need to do basic science is embodied in our Board of Regents policy that the re reserves the right of all faculty, and I quote, to explore all avenues of scholarship, research, and creative expression, end quote. Our university has a long, successful, and life-changing history of searching for and developing cures and treatments for some of the most devastating illnesses and conditions, and we need to continue to do that work. We also need vigilant attention to the fact that the world is in constant change, driven in part by the technology that arises from basic science research, but driven in larger part by economics, conflict, religion, government policy, population growth, and more. And to paraphrase a recent report entitled The Heart of the Matter by a panel of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the research portfolio and curricula of all great research universities must be balanced with the arts, humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences. Another quote, the humanities and social sciences are not merely elective, nor are they elite or elitist. And I agree. They go beyond the immediate and the instrumental to help us understand the past and the future. Our great university must lead in the integration of these disciplines, and I'm proud that we can do that by combining our strengths to address some of the grand challenges of our state and society, which form the cornerstone of our Twin Cities campus strategic plan. Now, before I leave the subject of research, I have to mention the success of our MenDrive initiative. MenDrive, Minnesota Discovery Research and Innovation Economy, began by identifying our strengths, requiring interdisciplinary approaches, and laying the groundwork, really, for a strategic plan, which emphasizes transdisciplinary research, which is the kind of work that only a research with our breadth and depth can do, our research university can do. And better yet, MenDrive represents another great example of a true partnership with the state, who is investing $18 million recurring every year, and we're grateful for that. In these past three years, We've hired with that money 31 new faculty members. And MenDrive Research, with 144 external partners, has leveraged almost $60 million in additional state, federal, and corporate funding. 
It means, among other projects, medical school faculty exploring brain cells that could prevent drug addiction relapses, and CFANS faculty working to halt soil contamination on greater Minnesota family farms. MenDrive demonstrates clearly our impact on the state's innovation and entrepreneurial culture and enable us to add faculty at a time in which others were cutting, and it supports our researchers with the kinds of partnerships that move basic researchers, research to discoveries that could not be seen or heard. The reinvigoration and improvement of our academic health center and especially our medical school has been another consistent priority of mine. With Vice President and Dean Brooks Jackson at the helm, we are working to forge a historic integrated enterprise with our partners at Fairview. Our aim is to create a new integrated academic health system. And last year, Governor Dayton's Blue Ribbon Task Force recommended and the legislature invested $30 million in our medical school. And it was exciting last month to help open our new clinics and surgery center, which we shepherded from vision to design to completion in three years. But our health sciences have also suffered when we have fallen short of who we are and who we want to be. The first, of course, was around our human participant research. After years of various reviews and at the Senate's urging, we completed an external view of our human participant research policies and procedures. The state's legislative auditor, Jim Nobles, also completed a review. Both reviews were blunt and required significant responses. We present reports monthly to the legislature and to our Board of Regents on our progress on implementing the many rec recommendations of these reviews, and I'll testify at the State Capitol over the next few weeks about our progress. Recently, we released another report on the Department of Psychiatry that identified many of the same troubling challenges. Those are serious issues, but they are being addressed. David Strauss, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Vice Chair for Research, Administration, Ethics, and Policy at Columbia University, who is a member of the external review team, will be returning to campus at the end of this month to evaluate how we've done in responding to his report. And we recently welcomed back Legislative Auditor Nobles to our campus, and we expect his evaluation of our progress on our implementation plan in the summer. I'm listening carefully as to concerns as we keep our pledge to be a model for human participant research. It remains a very pressing issue for me and for our Office of the Vice President for Research. Excuse me, I'm fighting the flu. Listen to stakeholders, listening to stakeholders, particularly students and faculty, is key to my decision making, and it's essential to nurturing a culture of cooperation, collaboration, and productive conversations. I listen in formal and informal way. As I mentioned, student office hours inspire me, and I also invite regularly groups of faculty to lunch, and I began staff lunches last year. We also work with faculty governance to increase collaboration, and this year we added a faculty member to attend meetings of my senior leadership team. Moving forward, that person will be the immediate past chair of the FCC. And while we don't always agree on an issue, and often things may move more slowly than we like, when it comes to shared governance, we are a model among all of our research universities, and it's an essential part of our rich history here. There's no area in which we all need to listen more carefully than in our work to create a more welcoming and respectful campus climate and to promote diversity. While we are not where we want to be, since I became president, the number of undergraduate students of color on the Twin Cities campus has increased to more than 20%, but our progress in increasing the number of American Indian under and underrepresented students of color and creating a climate for success has been moving slower than I would have hoped. While we have to have significant resources devoted to both, we must do better. And that's the reason why we launched our CORE 2025 Strategic Initiative. CORE stands for Community Outreach, Retention, and Engagement. It's a high-touch, early outreach program to make sure that you engage students of color as early as the sixth grade. We'll work with high-achieving multicultural students to help enhance their college preparation and create ties and aspirations that we hope will make the university their top college choice. In, make, in attracting new faculty of color, Provost Hansen has collaborated with deans to expand cluster hirings, and our Twin Cities College of Liberal Arts has been a leader. CLA right now is in the final stages of hiring four tenure track or tenured faculty in the Race, Indigeneity, Gender, and Sexuality, or RIGS, initiative. It's a part of a collaborative effort between the RIGS department and other units in CLA. But clearly, as we increase the number of faculty of color, we must do better in creating an environment that encourages them to stay. 
In particular, our African American and American Indian faculty have a different experience on our campus from our white or Asian faculty, and also in some areas, our women faculty. Our employee engagement surveys and other faculty surveys and conversations tell us this is so, and it's consistent, unfortunately, with national trends. So here we must also do better. The gap in engagement between our white faculty and some faculty of color is more like a chasm. And we must and we will do better to ensure an environment that attracts and retains the nation's best faculty. Two years ago, in my State of the University address, I committed to campus climate being a priority, and it came in response to students. We changed the way our university police department issues descriptions of suspects and alleged crimes to address concerns that our previous practice promoted racial profiling. That came after students told me of their experience and provided me with overwhelming data. We convened a campus climate work group comprised of senior leaders and they are developing and implementing new strategies to ensure that all of our faculty, students and staff experience a welcoming and respectful campus environment. Last semester, we, we created a bias response team to quickly assemble after bias incidents are reported. And among other things, we're consistently honored for our commitment to L, GLBT students, and we've invested in infrastructure to better, to better them. And I know, I know, that individually, each of these may seem like small steps, but together and with other steps in the future, greater and necessary change will happen. Now let me turn to a few things that loom especially large before us. First, freedom of expression and the freedom to pursue legal and ethical academic inquiry, scholarship, and research. They are central to the life and values of a world-class land-grant research university. A national political climate has trickled down to us that seems to permit obstructionist shouting and bullying over reason, debate, and the sort of unfettered exploration that has made the United States the envy of the world for our thought leadership across the science, the arts, and the humanities. And on speech, there can be no compromise. I understand the FCC is actively debating these issues, and I welcome that. Our Board of Regents policy guarantees the freedom to speak or write as a public citizen without institutional restraint or discipline. I am opposed to hate speech of any kind. While the university encourages all members of the community to speak with respect and understanding of others, we should not forbid speech that shocks, hurts, or angers. We must not tolerate the shouting down of points of view as we've seen in our community in recent months. As our law school professor, Dale Carpenter, who's a national thought leader on this topic, has told me, quote, the best response to offensive ideas is to counter them with better ideas. So I urge us all to consider other points of view, to allow even our most disliked opponents to speak, and then for us to counter their words with even more eloquent and effective messages. If there's any space in the society to do that, it is this space we call the university. This place must not only be one filled with all kinds of ideas, conversations, and debates, but also one that allows students from all economic backgrounds to thrive and to not be burdened by the costs of debt. As the first in my family to attend college, it's important to me that we balance access and excellence as we develop tuition and enrollment strategies. And as I said earlier, over the past five years, we have a strong record of affordability, and we've been true to our land-grant mission by serving our Minnesota students as our top priority. Eight years ago, tuition was reduced dramatically for out-of-state students. That was a decision that vastly diversified and improved the quality of our student body and continues to transform us into the national university we want to be. That decision strengthened our role as a talent magnet for a state, and it actually increased total revenue. In other words, the strategy worked and demonstrates that sound tuition policy can be a path to excellence and diversity. Currently, the Board of Regents and our colleagues of the legislature are engaged in a healthy conversation about our tuition policy. It's important, and I urge you to pay close attention and participate because it can affect our revenues and the excellence of our university. As we consider tuition, we must keep need-based and merit-based financial aid programs strong and keep resident tuition and fee increases as low as possible without sacrificing the flexibility we need to manage our resources, especially in the face of uncertain or even diminishing state support. When it comes down to it, my view is that those families who can afford to pay their fair share should. Those who cannot should be helped with financial aid. If, to ensure excellence, to reward our employees and to keep up with inflation, 
We do have to raise tuition. We should work tirelessly to offset those increases for the lowest income families with additional investment in financial aid. For the 2016-17 academic year, I have proposed for discussion a 15% increase for our out-of-state students that will gradually move us to the Big Ten midpoint. Our out-of-state tuition is the lowest in the Big Ten. Now, we will do this in a way that mitigates the impact on current students. It's been a difficult decision, but balanced against a wide range of differing views and the reality that right now we are an outlier with our peers I believe we remain a bargain for out-of-state students and an extraordinary value for all of our students. Our non-resident, non-reciprocity students, or about 14% of incoming Twin Cities undergraduates, are among the most difficult to attract, and their academic credentials generally lead all of our applicants. And at a rate of about 25%, after they graduate, they remain in Minnesota and become business, community, and cultural leaders. We can't make it so expensive that such imported young talent shuns us and so we must be poised to adjust when needed. Now, I heard that passionately from a student a few weeks back. During my regular student office hours, a sophomore accounting name, major named R Riley Knorr came to protest, very politely, that this proposed spike in tuition for out-of-state non-reciprocity students was too high. He told me that it was important to him that students from around the nation and the world shared ideas and friendship in Middlebrook Hall, where he lives. He was passionate about the importance of geographic diversity and the different worldviews it brings to his experience on our Twin Cities campus. Now, Riley happens to be from Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, not some distant city in another state, and he wants to learn from and meet people who are different from him. His words and perspective will stick with me as we move forward and the Regents Act on these important policy and budget issues in the coming months. And I think Riley is here, too. Would you stand up? Nice to see you again. Another challenge to our future is the upcoming transition of talent and loss of institutional memory. Chancellor Jackie Johnson, who for the past decade has kept our University of Minnesota Morris campus nationally ranked and universally respected, is retiring after 10 years of tremendous leadership. Jackie, thank you. The search is on, and we hope to have a successor for Chancellor Johnson in place when she leaves on June 30th. Dean Steve Crouch of CSE is stepping down to retirement. Marilyn Speedy of Pharmacy is retiring, and the law school dean, David Whitman, is set to become president of Hamilton College. And I thank all of them for their service to this university. And among our senior leadership team, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer Richard Futzenreiter is retiring in June. Fitz has been an invaluable advisor to me and an incredible advocate for this university for 24 years. We will feel the absence of his wisdom, humor, strong opinions, creativity, and integrity. Our general counsel, Bill Donahue, has represented our university so ably since 1982, is also retiring. Bill built a wonderful culture in the OGC office and will take with him a treasure trove of understanding how this institution operates, and we will miss his guidance and loyalty. Fitz and Bill, thank you, and would you please stand so we can give you a round of applause and thanks. With Fitz's retirement, I'm proposing reorganizing our senior leadership team, and I propose to the Board of Regents, and I'm consulting it internally with others, the idea of creating a new senior vice president for finance and operations position. University services, human resources, finance and budget, and information technology would report to that new leader. Structure is common at peer institutions. I think it could bring great value to all of our campuses, and with Fitz's retirement, there would be no increase in senior leader headcount. Simultaneously, we want to recognize that the Office of Academic Affairs and Provost has assumed additional responsibilities for global programs, public engagement, strategic planning, and other areas, and to reflect the primacy of the university's academic mission, proposed to change the title of our chief academic officer to that of executive vice president and provost. Now, in the range of responsibilities that I have, and of all the tasks that any university president has, leading philanthropic efforts is essential. I spend about 20% of my time raising money, and I enjoy doing it because it, of what it brings back to the U. Last year, we raised $351 million for our students, our faculty, our research, our healthcare enterprise, and for so many things that make this a great place. It was a record year, and more importantly, more than 78,000 
78,000 different people contributed to this university. A great testament to what our alumni and friends think of us. We're now on the verge of a major philanthropic effort that will be transformative for this university. Work, work that promises to fund faculty, graduate, and undergraduate students' research and capital needs. The next couple of years will see my growing involvement in national and global fundraising to drive our university forward. But when I look into the future, the most exciting, enduring and piece of what is ahead is our Driving Tomorrow strategic plan. Philanthropy will support it. Driving Tomorrow is the achievement of countless faculty, students, and staff on expanded teams to build a more agile university and a dynamic campus culture. It's a, a culture of ambition that will make us attractive to the best and brightest faculty and staff, students. We have a long-lasting impact on the, and it will have a long-lasting impact on the excellence and reputation of our university. I applaud Provost Hansen and our faculty and staff for students for moving it forward with a passion. And it demonstrates that this academic community is determined to build on already world-class strengths and to unleash across barriers our full potential. It's not another cookie-cutter academic strategic plan that makes your eyes glaze over. The five grand challenge areas that months of conversation have landed, and I hope you know what they are by now, are feeding the world sustainably, advancing health through tailored solutions, enhancing individual and community capacity for a changing world, fostering just and equitable communities, and ensuring clean water and sustainable ecosystems. And the launching of the related interdisciplinary Grand Challenges courses is also exciting. Science, women's health, public policy, different cultures and religions, language policy, arts, racism, they're all tied up in the Grand Challenges of water quality, of hunger, of climate change, and of sustainable communities in Minnesota or in faraway lands. A recent NPR story that you may have heard highlighted the impact of team-taught transdisciplinary courses. This one is called, Can We Feed the World Without Destroying It? Associate Professor Jason Hill of our Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems, one of the instructors, told NPR, quote, when the professors themselves are disagreeing over the answer to a question like that, imagine how the students are approaching this and what they're thinking. That's the fun of a class like this. We can't tell students the answer, but allow them to discover it for themselves. And that's exactly what we want and need to do. This is your strategic plan, your roadmap for the future of our university, and you've delivered on what the strategic plan was intended to be when we started 18 months ago. It's not an inanimate product. It should be a rallying cry for new processes of teaching, research, and public engagement, and a reimagining of our land-grant tradition. Now, in closing, as I look around the room, I know that from time to time, we don't agree on all issues. And once in a while, we disappoint each other and even perhaps doubt each other's motivations. Sometimes the headlines embarrass us all. But I'm confident that we share common goals of wanting an exceptional University of Minnesota with a worldwide reputation that is acceptable to the best students we can find. Of striving for a university that reflects the increasing diversity of our state and nation and that unfettered by politics or ideology produce, per, pursues truth and new knowledge to better our society. We share a vision of place-based centers of learning across our system, of personal growth and of discovery that pre prepares our students to go on to great success, to close gaps, to open doors, and help future generations understand their history and each other's. I want us to recognize the power, compassion, and undeniable influence we have together and to embrace how far we've come over the past five years. I want us to work together to improve what we need to improve, and over the next five years, I'm committed and determined to drive us to even more collaborative, transformative, and extraordinary tomorrows. Thank you. Taylor. Hello again to the audience. So I will start out with a couple of questions uh, that we received electronically and then we'll I'll have room. I can't see you all but get your attention and we'll have a question from the audience and continue. So the first one I have for you, a uh, faculty member asked for uh, some more details or ideas about your plan to place, place the arts and humanities on a par with STEM disciplines, including the necessary allocation of staff resources. So two thoughts about that. One is many of our uh, arts, humanities, and certainly social science programs uh, on the scale 
uh, with many of the best programs in the STEM field. Our economics department, our American studies department, our political science department, others are really, uh, are really very strong. Um, but the opportunity, I think, is for us as an institution to get beyond uh, thinking just about disciplines. Because the grand challenge motif that, that the teams of hundreds of faculty from across the university have brought together uh, really enable people to bring their strengths, their disciplinary strengths together to tackle these huge problems. And I think that's where the opportunity uh, for growth will come, not narrowly on a discipline, but more broadly on a team that tackles a problem. Terrific. Um, so a late question that came in from a student asked about, um, well, it doesn't ask about, but I, I know your administration is committed to adre adequately addressing mental health issues, particularly that our students are facing, but I think there's an understanding or agreement that we're not, we're maybe a little under-resourced in that, in that area. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, we have uh, received a, uh, a um, communication from, uh, the from both graduate and professional students that they truly feel the need for this. Uh, I share that need. Uh, what I've asked people to do is identify where uh, we are understaffed, and importantly, what kind of staff um, do, do we actually need to provide the kind of of care that our students deserve to have, and whether that means uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, therapists, uh, what can we do to staff up because the demand for these services is not constant across the, the year, so what, can we have people on call, if you will, in the community that, would, that we could call to reduce wait times? Sure. So I'm well aware of this, and we're committed to making it better. It is a, um, we talked about it at FCC, and it was a, it's a very um, emotionally <coughs> deep topic and, and we're very concerned as you are. A faculty member from uh, Duluth uh, asked, how will the increase of Twin Cities campus undergraduate enrollment impact allocation of funds and enrollment on the system campuses? How does this fit into the redefining of UMD's mission? That's a really good question and I think the honest answer is that nobody really actually knows. Um, we get on the Twin Cities campus um, a pretty small percentage of students who transfer from our Duluth campus. Um, I know students on our Duluth campus who had an offer from the Twin Cities campus and chose to go to Duluth. Uh, the Duluth experience is, is different than it is here. So uh, I'm not convinced, and I could easily be wrong, that, that a growth in the Twin Cities population is gonna cannibalize um, the, the Duluth entry pool. Will some students choose to do that if, if they have the Twin Cities option? I think that's a fair, fair concern. How big that number is and what we do to mitigate it by growing the, uh, the enrollment uh, pool, uh, application enrollment pool for all of UMD, uh, we're just gonna, gonna have to see. And again, I'm completely committed, as I mentioned in, in my talk, to, in terms of the number of dollars that we've uh, invested on our Duluth campus. Uh, I want them to succeed. They are us, and we all need to succeed together. I'm going to ask another electronic question, and then I think we have roving mics maybe in anticipation of the question. After this one, we could get somebody in the live audience ready to, to go. So a couple of students raised questions about improving the climate for graduate and postdoctoral students. Uh, specifically, uh, one student asked how to manage the, the unequal power dynamic between, I'm sure you remember back in the day, uh, the, the unequal Both power ways, dynamic yeah. between the um, advisors and, and, and graduate students, and if you've had any thoughts about how on a system-wide level we could try to address this. Yeah, that's, that's another important thing that we need to do. Uh, the, the provost has uh, taken to herself to uh, sort of re, recreate and, and revitalize the graduate school and organizing both graduate student activities and professional student activities into sort of parallel uh, activity. Uh, that's underway. I think the next step is to enhance what we do for postdoctoral uh, students. It's, it's, it's interesting. You know, as you look at your, at your academic career, you identify with where you did your undergraduate work and you identify where your graduate work is, but there's not using an alumni associate uh, wherever you did your postgraduate work if you did so. So that's an, another great opportunity for us and it's, it's uh, on the work plan for the coming year. Do we, do we have a question from the audience here? Naomi is here. Okay. I think there's a mic coming. Uh, hello. Naomi Sheeman, College of Liberal Arts. Um, I appreciated a lot of 
pretty much everything that you were saying, President Kaler. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to bringing together the problems around human subjects research, specifically in the Department of Psychiatry, with other things that you emphasized, um, the grand challenges and the concern for serious diversity. Um, I mean, what we're seeing is a culture of arrogance, entitlement, and impunity that too often has been met, either not at all, and previous administrations have really avoided it, or if met, met with a culture of bureaucracy, regulation, and accountability. And that may be important and necessary, but what we really need is a culture of critical engagement, serious diversity, and responsibility. That is the ethos that was represented in a lot of the other things that you were saying. And the involvement, I mean, when senators brought a resolution to the faculty senate, it was not for a one-off, do an investigation and hand it over to the responsible parties. It was for involve us, involve people in the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, who know how to deal with issues of culture and diversity, and when people with power and privilege use it to intimidate. And what what can happen here to bring those changes about so we have deep cultural change? That, that's a great question, <laughs> Naomi, and, and I, I would actually clap for that too. Uh, it is, it's a journey uh, right now. Part of, part of our challenge is getting new leadership in the Department of Psychiatry. We have an offer out to uh, a very strong candidate who, who I believe is meant to decide soon uh, if she will take that position. Uh, we have grown uh, the IRB capacity pretty dramatically and open uh, membership to that to people uh, who want to talk about, who don't necessarily need to know about the biology of what's going on, but can, can help us understand the culture uh, and equity. We have a community advisory board where we brought people from different backgrounds in to provide a way for, for aggrieved parties to, to seek a, uh, a resolution outside the university. Uh, we have a lot of moving parts, but my goodness, we are not there yet. It, is, it, is, it will take literally years to change that culture. Uh, the integration that, that we have uh, with Fairview uh, underway, uh, our every great hope is that that will become successful to create the M Health uh, integrated health system, and that will allow the nurses and the docs to have a common organization. I think part of the, the, the tension here is, is between employees of different organizations. Makes it hard to drive uh, decision making. Makes it hard for, for UMP docs or leaderships to get information about personnel actions that are going on in Fairview. And, and I could go on. It is, it's, we have a path to success of 62 recommendations uh, from, from Strauss's committee. Um, we, will, we will get there, but it is, it's a big lift and we welcome welcome engagement of people from other parts of the university to bring the kind of cultural viewpoints and cultural change uh, that, that's needed. And not only in psychiatry, that's the, the, the pinnacle perhaps in the newspaper, but across all of what we do with human subjects to be sure that our doctors are getting the right ethical training, that their, their perspectives, their ability to balance conflict of interest, that all of those things are where every one of us want them to be. So we welcome the engagement. There were two Bernie Sanders questions. The one was, would you please invite him to give a talk? So I won't ask for an answer to that Thank one. Thank you. Um, the second, Democratic presidential nominee Bernie Sanders claims that college could be free. Do you see this as a plausible goal? How do you view the current support for higher education in the Minnesota legislature? So, um, you know, you can make everything in the world free. It's just a matter of who pays for it. So, you know, you could, you could I mean, it's, it's kind of, I meant to make a little joke there, but it, it if, if government decided to, to spend all of the money necessary to make public higher education free, that's a doable thing. I don't think the political will to do that is present among our, our elected uh, representatives. I also think that actually, you know, Europe has in many countries, fewer now than, than 20 years ago, the concept of free education. I think if a student has something in the game, they're more engaged, and they don't spend uh, the important part of their creative younger years wandering around being a student. So I think having some engagement is, is important. Uh, so the freedom, uh, if government wants to pay for it, I mean, that's a fiscal issue, but I think that engagement uh, is important, and um, we, we can't invite political candidates to campus, but other people can, I mean, rent a hall. Uh, 
So you did talk about this at some length in your uh, remarks, but I, we got so many questions about this, I wanted to come back. Um, so questions about tuition, specifically out-of-state tuition increases were numerous. Please respond to the following if you can. How do you see the out-of-state tuition increase impacting enrollment for each of the campus uh, system campuses? Why is college education so expensive? And will future university students ever see a tuition decrease? So the... Um we will monitor very carefully what the impact on, on an out-of-state increase is. And again, uh, although I propose for discussion a 15% increase here, once a student is here, they would see only much more modest year-on-year -year tuition. So you're not saying go to the university so you'll get a 15% increase in your tuition every year. That's, that's not what we're, what we're saying. Uh, we'll, we'll watch it carefully. Uh, we have proposals to uh, not increase uh, tuition on our um, system campuses, a modest increase of, of out-of-state tuition on our, uh, on our Duluth campus. Uh, we are finely attuned to the relationship between supply and demand and, and price. And uh, we, we want to watch that carefully. We want to grow selectively in areas where we have capacity and where the state has needs. Um, Will we see a, a reduction in tuition? My philosophy is, as I said in my, in my prepared remarks, that if a family can afford to pay, they should pay, and we should use resources to enable people who can't pay to come uh, to school. So, you know, if you have a, um, if you're a well-to-do family in, in Edina, and your daughter decides to come to the University of Minnesota in our honors program instead of going to Stanford full ride, full, full freight, you just bought a new car. So I, I think we're good there. So well, I'm going to, get, again, do one more question from my list, and then if the rovers could try to find somebody. Um, let's see. Uh, so this is kind of a, a multi-part question to test your memory and your judgment. Um, from, a, from several employees uh, regarding salaries, in light of the uh, administrative, well, I'll just put it this way. How is the pledge to cut $90 million in administrative bloat by 2019 coming along? Um, maybe we just just one at a time. Sure. So, first off, I don't think we have 58 million or 90 million administrative bloat. Oh, we have agree. 90 million dollars of people doing administrative work that we think could be repurposed to higher and better uses. And as I mentioned, we're 58 million dollars of the way there, 32 million dollars more to go in the next two to three years. So many units on campus are already working hard with limited administrative help. Why, why will these cuts continue for three more years and where are those future administrative cuts supposed to come? Well, we ask colleges and units to reallocate a small uh, amount each year to, to address that. And again, you know, it's a $3.6 billion budget, and we're looking at, let's say, round numbers, $36 million. It's, in a, from a percentage point of view, not dramatic. Now, the problem, of course, is that those monies are used in different ways. And what I tell people at every opportunity is that you know what your job is better than anybody else. And where can you take some effort and put it into more productive uses? I mean, a few years ago, I challenged the university senate to meet less often. Yes. And the senate kept working when you did that. So there are things that we can do less of or more effectively. Um, and I just think we've got to scour everywhere to find those. Great. Uh, is there a movement to get all university staff to receive a living wage? I guess that's predicated on the idea that you don't think we have that. But, uh, well, you know, that's interesting. So a living wage in, um, in Minneapolis or the Twin Cities uh, is, is a knowable thing. People calculate that. And it's $11, a little over $11 an hour, which is not a lot of money. Um, but we do our, our entry-level jobs, by and large, are above that. We negotiated in the union contracts uh, recently uh, $15 an hour uh, minimum wages in a lot of those areas. So I haven't done a survey, but I think a lot of jobs uh, do meet that living wage, as modest as that number uh, is. Uh, and I, I am not comfortable leading a place where uh, people are, are working full time and not being able to support their families. And we need to find ways to make that better. Thank you. So do we have uh, a question? Well, yes, one we do. OK. Yes, greetings, okay. President Kaler. I've got some very good news for you. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Dardi. I'm a 1968 graduate from the College of Education, who I dearly love. Well, I was down here in Tampa on the campaign trails, and I got an invitation to the Joe Biden talk up here. So I came all the way up here to hear his talk over at Union Depot. 
And I thought he did an excellent job and ended it up with a Gandhi dancer theme. And ironically, while working on the campaign trails, I happened to end up living here on the famous east side and got to represent the railroad swing district over here at Harding High School. So I got elected to be a delegate and a motion came to an SDS leader. Is there a motion from the floor? And I said, there is. I think the tolerance curriculum should be adopted in this state. And it's a brilliant curriculum. And also, uh, I'm gonna throw in a tough chaser one for you. I feel the real black hole of the economy of this state is the east side. 3M's left are leaving, aren't they? The, the, the company, the best and brightest company in America that have been in sandpaper and Scotchgard is leaving. I feel this has pulled every school and every student over there into a sinkhole or a black hole that it's, it's hard for me to address. And my bouquet from the south there, uh, I hope you can turn that flower into a, some kind of Andromeda strain over there, some deal like that. Or maybe change the uh, Fitzgerald Lorenz transforms over there. So finally, what five recommendations would you recommend as a top scientist, inventions that you could put into the east side over there, inventions to save a Johnson High School, Harding High School, and save the east side? Thank you. Well, the, um, the best way to save neighborhoods uh, is to have people have jobs. It's pretty simple. And I, you know, 3M frequently talks about relocating parts of their operations to other parts of the country. They have a big semiconductor, I think it is, business in, in Austin, Texas. But I had not heard that they are abandoning uh, the east side, and I hope that's not true. Uh, but again, the, the economic development activities uh, are, are critical to revitalizing parts of these cities. I think I saw a question here. Yeah. Thank you for uh, privileging the voice of um, another member of the dominant group before me, which, uh, you know, I did have the mic before him. So on February 9, 2015, members of Who's Diversity took over your office in an attempt to restore a sense of justice to multiply marginalized students on this campus. And as a result, those students were arrested, jailed, and sanctioned by the Office of Student Conduct and Hennepin County Police Department. And I was just in a meeting with you last week in the African American and African Studies Department. And when asked what is the status of the demands that Who's Diversity presented, the eight demands, you spoke in a way that suggested that those demands were actually being met right now. So I'm curious, what are the implications of claiming ownership over demands that you refused to meet when we took over your office and now claiming that they're actually uh, in the process of being met? without crediting the work of student activists on this campus that are actually the momentum and the impetus behind this, the substantive changes that we all desire? Well, actually, I do give uh, student activists, student voices uh, credit, as I did in my remarks about the, uh, uh, the crime alerts. Uh, and, you know, you, I don't think, believe me, but you and I actually have almost the same goals. We just have very different ways of getting around them. Uh, we've made investments in, uh, in President's Emerging Scholars, which bring opportunities for, for students to come. Uh, the Core 2025, I mentioned, is a way to grow uh, pipelines. Uh, the Huntley House is an investment that, that is working and working well. Uh, the efforts around hiring more uh, diverse faculty, the Riggs Faculty Initiative uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and we've seen increases. Uh, not um, in black students to the degree that, that we would like. In fact, actually numerically it's a small decrease, but good growth in, in the Hispanic student population. So I actually think we're making progress on what is one of the most vexing problems of our time. And I do credit you for your, for your enthusiasm, for your passion. I disagree with your method. I don't think occupying my office is a way to advance our conversation. Uh, but I do credit you for your activism. I believe, unless they tell me otherwise, we have time for one more question. Um, so what is your philosophy on supporting academic units who, for the short term, are not meeting enrollment goals? For example, the university has been supporting law school during a difficult time, but that support has, at least in principle, negatively impacted other colleges. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. What we have is a, a, a university, and we have a university, which means we have a universe of programs, and not all of them are going to be able to thrive financially at, at any given uh, point in time. Uh, and, but if they're core and high quality, uh, we want to, uh, to invest in them. Uh, the law school issue is, uh, is obviously driven by the, the demand and, or lack of demand for law students, but it's a very 
uh, central part of our university. It's a strong law school, strong part of the state of Minnesota. And so uh, we constructed a plan to manage it, it financially. Uh, law school uh, LSATs at least have been, seemed to plateau and maybe trickling upward. Uh, so we think that holding the law school quality firm while the enrollment recovers uh, was an appropriate thing to do. Uh, and we do that from time to time uh, in different units as they begin to adjust to different economic uh, realities. Well, we've run out of time, I believe. I, w I want to thank you very much for your, uh, thank you. your effort, and I want to thank all of you for participating. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I hope you feel better. Where are you off to? Florida. <laughs>